Welcome to the Terezin Music Foundation Annual Gala Concert with pianist Garrick Olson, Madeline Albright, plus other exciting artists and guests from around the world. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Ludwig, director of the Terrazine Music Foundation. We're in Boston Symphony Hall, where I've spent much of my career performing and producing concerts. Standing outside the hall, I feel sadness and a sense of loss as it has been silent during this pandemic. To many of us, this is our cultural home. We chose November 9th for our virtual gala because it marks two major historic events in the 20th century. The first being Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in 1938, when thousands of Jewish businesses, schools, and synagogues were ransacked and destroyed throughout Germany and Austria. 51 years later, the Berlin Wall fell, marking the end of the Cold War. Both events are connected to periods of tremendous loss, destruction, and division. In 2020, the pandemic has also been a period of great separation and loss. Tonight, we share music of comfort and hope. We begin with the music of Erwin Schulhoff. Schulhoff was among the most promising musical talents of the early 20th century. He studied with Claude Debussy and twice won the prestigious Mendelssohn Prize. In World War I, he was wounded while serving on the Russian front and he was imprisoned in an Italian POW camp. The great suffering Schulhoff witnessed reshaped his music and led him to become an ardent communist. Schulhoff was a dedicated champion of contemporary piano repertoire. He was among the first to master performance technique for the innovative quarter tone piano and its complex double keyboard. His compositions reflect his political leanings as well as the musical and cultural trends of the 20s and 30s. He was especially influenced by jazz and Dada. In a 1932 cantata, Schulhoff set the Communist Manifesto to music, once again asserting his political convictions. In 1941, trapped in Nazi-occupied Prague, he obtained Soviet citizenship for himself, his wife, and their son Petra. But their plans to emigrate were dashed, with the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Schulhoff was a triple target, a Jew carrying a Soviet passport whose music was labeled degenerate and subversive. Schulhoff and Petra were sent to the Würzburg concentration camp where he died of tuberculosis on August 18, 1942. Petra drew this portrait of his father on his deathbed. After holding his dying father in his arms, Petra was forced to dig his father's grave.
In the 1920s, the newly established Czechoslovak Republic was home to three towering composers, Smetna, Dvořák, and Janáček. Pavel Haas was considered Janáček's prized pupil and successor. By the mid-1930s, Haas was a very highly regarded composer for films, theaters, and concert halls. But his professional and personal life suffered a dramatic turn with the Nazi occupation in 1939. Performances by Jewish artists and composers were banned, and the Nuremberg racial laws forbid marriages between Jews and non-Jews. In order to keep his non-Jewish wife and their daughter from being sent to a concentration camp, Haas divorced her. On December 2, 1941, Haas himself was sent on one of the first transports to the Terezin concentration camp. For Jews from Germany and Nazi-occupied lands, Terezin was primarily a way station to Auschwitz. To hide this, the Nazis labeled Terezin a paradise and retirement ghetto for prominent and elderly Jews. But more than 33,000 prisoners died in Terezin of starvation and rampant illness. Remarkably, Terezin's prisoners developed a rich cultural community. They began by holding concerts in secret adding more as amateur and professional artists arrived with each transport. The Nazis soon discovered these events and allowed them as a means of suppressing escape attempts and pleas to the outside world for help. Later, in a cruel calculus, the Nazis forced the imprisoned artists to perform in two major propaganda projects designed to counter evidence of the final solution. In the summer of 1944, the Nazi SS hosted a visit by an international Red Cross committee, and they also produced a propaganda film. In order to mask the appearance of overcrowding, they sent 7,500 elderly people to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. They superficially beautified Terezin with false shop facades and even brought tulips from occupied Holland. And they constructed a concert pavilion in the central square a visiting Red Cross delegate stands in the foreground as prisoners listen to a performance by the ghetto swingers. Although separation from his family, along with the miserable conditions of the camp, had taken a tremendous toll on him, Pavel Haas composed some of his best known works in Terezin. When Haas composed four songs on Chinese poetry, he had already been in Terezin for more than two years. It is his last masterpiece and perhaps his most personal work, a setting of poems expressing loneliness and longing for home. In the final song, A Sleepless Night, the piano conveys anxious tossing and turning. Twice we hear this poignant line, I am thinking of when we will meet again. A simple lullaby-like bridge becomes an upbeat la 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 perhaps a message of encouragement and hope. This song is Haas's final testament of love for his family before the infamous Mengele sent him to the gas chambers of Auschwitz in October 1944.
Voices for peace, human rights, diversity, and compassion make a great difference in our world. To honor individuals committed to these ideals, Terrazine Music Foundation bestows the annual Terrazine Legacy Award. Recipients receive a chance to speak on a cause dear to their heart and a beautiful glass sculpture. This sculpture is designed by glass artist Steve Weinberg, whose works are in the permanent collection of the Louvre and many other world-class museums. Good evening, everyone. I am so pleased to be a part of the Terezine Music Foundation's 2020 virtual gala. TMF and its executive director, Mark Ludwig, are a much needed force for good in this world. And Mark is a dear colleague and friend, as well as a tireless advocate for the unifying power of music and the ennobling pursuit of human rights and democracy. My name is Norman Eisen. I am the grateful recipient of the Foundation's 2019 Terezine Legacy Award and honored to be here tonight to present the 2020 award to our distinguished honoree. As myself, the child of a Czechoslovak Holocaust survivor who was so deeply privileged to return to Prague to represent the United States as its chief diplomat, the foundation is near to my heart. The foundation's work over the last nearly 30 years to honor the legacy of the Terezine artists for future generations is a project in which I deeply believe, and one I was so glad to help as ambassador. Through the production of concert events across Europe and the United States, the commissioning of new pieces of music, and the education of students and individuals about the Holocaust and Terezin's history, the foundation fosters an appreciation for the resilience of the human spirit. The Terezin artists, along with 150,000 Jewish men, women, and children, were deported by the Nazis to Terezin, a concentration camp in what is now the Czech Republic. Uprooted from their homes and their families, they turned to creating works of theater, literature, painting, and above all, music. Their work 
is the ultimate testament to the uniquely human ability to remain resilient, indeed to live, even in times of unspeakable tragedy. This year in particular, the legacy of the Terezin artists has so much to offer us in the way of perseverance and hope. While we grapple with a global pandemic that has separated us from our friends and our family, upended our lives and our work, we must remember what we stand to gain, even in times of great darkness, when we come together for equality and justice. These values, much like music, unite us through time and space. The Foundation presents the Terezin Legacy Award each year to an individual who embodies and evinces the courage, the passion, and above all, the humanity of the Terezin artists and all those who persevered in the face of the unimaginable horror of the Holocaust. Tonight, I'm honored to my, present my friend, Secretary Madeleine Albright with the 2020 Terezin Legacy Award. While a full recounting of Secretary Albright's career and achievements would span the length of tonight's program, and then some, she is a professor, best-selling author, diplomat, and businesswoman who served as the first female Secretary of State of the United States from 1997 to 2001. Her remarkable Czechoslovak American Jewish tale is the subject of her book, Prague Winter. During her tenure as America's top diplomat, Secretary Albright, Madlenka to her Czech friends, was a tireless advocate for human rights and democracy. Her work distinguished her as one of the most admired and effective secretaries of state in American history. In addition, her trailblazing status as the first woman to hold the position of the United States top diplomat has inspired stateswomen and even a few statesmen the world over. While her legacy by the end of her tenure as secretary was remarkable enough, Madlenka has only continued to channel her passion for human rights and democracy into change making since she left public office. Today, to take only a few examples, she chairs the National Democratic Institute and is the president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation. In 2012, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor in recognition of her contributions to international peace and democracy. Dr. Albright's life, work, and personal connection to Czech and Terezin history, as well as her steadfast commitment to a more peaceful, just, and democratic world, make her an ideal recipient of this year's award. It is my sincere pleasure and privilege to present the 2020 Terezin Legacy Award to Secretary Madeleine Albright. Thank you, Ambassador Eisen, Norm, for your very, very generous words. I'm truly honored by this award and I'm deeply grateful to the Terezin Music Foundation and its director, Mark Ludwig, for upholding and amplifying the legacy of the musicians of Terezin. The foundation's work to recover, preserve and perform the music created by the Terezin artists and to commission new works by emerging artists has helped give voice to those who perished in the Holocaust and to all who are silenced by war or genocide. That mission of giving voice to the voiceless is one I have done my best to fulfill. As you know, I was born in Czechoslovakia 22 months before the Nazi invasion. My parents and I escaped to London, where my father served as head of broadcasting for our nation's government in exile. After the Nazis were defeated, we returned home, hoping to live a normal existence in a free land. But in February 1948, the communists staged a coup. 
My family sought refuge again, this time receiving a permanent and welcome home in the United States. Although I knew the basic outlines of the story from a young age, I didn't discover until I was almost 60 years old that my family's heritage was Jewish or that more than two dozen of my relatives, including three grandparents, had died in the Holocaust. I now have six grandchildren and I cannot look at them without realizing that at one time, before I was old enough to remember, I had been looked at upon with the same way and same degree of love that I now feel for those young people. And yet my grandparents as individuals were virtually unknown to me. I could not recall even saying the words grandmother or grandfather. In writing my 2012 book, Prague Winter, I hoped to learn more about them and the times in which they lived. And I also wanted to honor their memory. When I began my research, I was aware of the general facts surrounding my family's history and that of related events. But as I talked to experts and sifted through documents, I was able to dig a bit deeper. For example, I learned more about the period leading up to World War II, when many opinion leaders underestimated the Nazi menace. Even Winston Churchill wrote that Adolf Hitler might one day be remembered in favorable terms. I found that during the war, my father's broadcast team in London explicitly warned the Nazis against killing Czech Jews. In one case, the publicity succeeded in delaying a mass execution, but only for a month. I discovered that my paternal grandfather, Arnoš Korbel, succumbed to bronchial pneumonia just a few months after arriving in Terezin. I learned that the cardboard urn containing his ashes was probably among those removed from the camp and dumped in a river as part of the Nazi plan to conceal evidence of what they had done. I found out that several of my relatives, including my paternal grandmother Olga, my great uncle Rudolf, and my cousin Milena, were transported on the last trains to Auschwitz from Terezin. A few weeks more, and they might have survived. I, and I learned that the Gestapo had a file on my father, including the correct address in England of where our family was staying. Overall, the saga I told in Prague winter is a tragic one, but I did not come away from that project in despair. On the contrary, for me, it provided added testimony to the incredible human capacity to renew itself despite the presence of great evil. I was able to describe how the leaders of Czechoslovakia were able to restore their nation's independence after the country had been torn apart and conquered by the Third Reich. And I was able to tell about how the British, when backed into a corner, were able to survive 56 consecutive days of enemy bombing and thereby inspire the forces of democracy on both sides of the Atlantic. I reported on the daring plan of the Czech resistance to eliminate Reinhold Heydrich, the loathsome head of the German occupation, leading in to the only successful assassination of a major Nazi leader during the war. And I described how the remarkable people imprisoned at Terezin sustained their love for culture and learning despite the German effort to crush their will. Among the young artist of Terezin was my cousin Milena, about 11 years old at the time. Some 20 of her drawings are now in the possession of the Jewish Museum in Prague. Like her companions, she drew pictures of the kind that children draw of people and houses and animals and the sun. I was startled when doing research to discover what I believe to be a photograph of Milena taken during the infamous Red Cross inspection of Terezin. The inspectors, as you may know, were totally and inexcusably taken in by Nazi lies. At a press conference, they assured the world that the prisoners were enjoying a happy and carefree existence and that there was no truth to the rumor that some of them were being sent to so-called labor camps in the East. But of the 10 children in the picture with Milena, only one, a young Dutch boy survived. 
Although I came across numerous examples of cruelty and betrayal in my research, they are not what I will take with me as I look ahead. I will remember instead the abundant acts of resistance and courage performed by people facing horrors we can barely imagine. And I will also reflect on some of the historical lessons of that period. Leadership matters, wishful thinking is dangerous, and democracies must work together. Because in our era, no country can hope to be safe through its actions alone. After Prague Winter was released, I continued in spare moments to sort through notebooks and writings and letters that belonged to my father. One day in 2014, I came across what can only be described as a message in a bottle. It was a wartime journal belonging to my maternal grandmother, Ruzhena Spiglova. I will never know how it got into my parents' hands, but I do know that my grandmother wanted in her own words and I quote, to systematically remember what has already happened to the Jews, unquote. I was honored to be able to fulfill that goal by publishing her journal earlier this year in my newest book. And I was also grateful several years ago to be able to visit Terezin with my children and grandchildren to dedicate a plaque to all the members of our family, including Ruzhina, who were killed in the Holocaust. We traveled thousands of miles to honor people whose fates had been <clears throat> lost to history and whose connections to us we rediscovered and restored. Like so many other victims of the Holocaust, they left us with barely a trace. But as Elie Wiesel has reminded us, we are their trace. And as the Terezi Music Foundation reminds us, we can and must keep their legacy alive. So thank you so much for this honor and for everything you do to help us remember and to heal. Thank you, Ambassador Eisen and Dr. Albright. It is an honor to have you with us. I'm delighted to welcome pianist Garrick Olson to our virtual stage. Garrick is a dear friend and supporter of the Terezin Music Foundation. It's been my pleasure and honor to play for the Terezin Foundation a number of times at Symphony Hall in Boston on the occasion of galas. And it was my great honor also for the foundation to commission a work from Lubitsa Tchaikovska, which I premiered in Prague and Jerusalem, and have since recorded. I have so, I, I am very sorry not to be with you in person for this. I think we're all sorry about this enforced separation, but we make the best of it that we can. I suppose the piece I've chosen for tonight, uh, the Appassionata Sonata of Beethoven, is, is a perennially appropriate piece, of course, wildly popular. It's so exciting, but also violently dramatic and very tragic. Um, it's, it's a piece about loss and rage and, and uh, bewilderment and confusion and passion. So it's uh, sort of an accompaniment to some of the emotions that we all feel normally, but are intensified during this, this t awful time of separation. So I hope to be able to be back to play for you sometime soon, and I know you're all hoping that. But in the meantime, for now, here is Beethoven's Sonata Appassionata, Opus 57.
In addition to performing music composed during the Holocaust, TMF also commissions new musical works. These commissions, sponsored by generous donors, are a vibrant memorial to the artists who perished in the Shoah, and they are also a voice for all people silenced by oppression, war, or genocide. To date, we have sponsored more than 40 commissions, written for and performed by Garrick Olson, Simona Dinnerstein, Yefim Bronfman, and many others. All are significant contributions to the chamber repertoire and part of our ongoing concerts and Holocaust education programs. Here is the world premiere of our newest commission, In Search of Home by Mila Josufi, a gifted Afghan composer currently seeking asylum in the United States. Milad's piece is a setting of a poem he loved as a child, The Song of the Reed by the Persian mystic Rumi.
Not wind makes the flute sing If you don't have this power Don't play As a recipient of the 2017 Terrorism Legacy Award, it is my special privilege to present Dr. Anna Ornstein with this cherished award. Anna was 17 years old in 1944 when the Nazis occupied her native Hungary. Together, Mother and daughter survived deportation to Auschwitz twice. Tragically, the Nazis murdered the rest of their family. Anna and her mother returned to Hungary in 1945. She finished high school while her mother ran an orphanage for Jewish children. Anna soon married Paul Ornstein who had survived Nazi labor camps and with him 
escaped into West Germany. They earned their medical degrees from Heidelberg University School of Medicine, where a number of the faculty and classmates had been Nazi soldiers. Anna and Paul immigrated to the United States and graduated from the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis. Dr. Ornstein served as professor and emerita professor of child psychiatry at University of Cincinnati Medical School and later as a lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She was a training and supervising analyst at the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute, the Boston Psychoanalytic Society, and the Massachusetts Institute for Psychoanalysis. She has received the Distinguished Psychiatrist Lecturer Award of the American Psychiatric Association and many other honors. Throughout her career, Dr. Ornstein has also dedicated herself to speaking out against anti-Semitism and educating young people in high schools and college campuses about the Holocaust and contemporary issues of human rights. Students never forget Dr. Ornstein, her story her openness and the great empathy she brings to young minds grappling with the evils of fanaticism and genocide. Dr. Ornstein has written over 130 publications, most notably her memoir of Auschwitz, My Mother's Eyes. It's a moving and powerful book preserving a story we must always remember. Anna, I look forward to when we once again will sit in friendship and peace. My heartful congratulations on receiving this very special award. When the Hungarian police ordered us out of our homes when 100 of us were stuffed into a cattle wagon. And when we finally smelled the black smoke of Auschwitz, I wondered if anyone knew or cared what was happening to us. Even after we arrived in the United States, I was convinced that nobody cared. Terrazin Music Foundation had proven me wrong. They had done more than keep the memory alive to remember these horrendous events. They created music that helped us to heal our wounds. Unfortunately, this year we cannot be together to enjoy this music, to celebrate the gala together. But this does not keep me from asking you to please support the Terrazin Music Foundation as a place where you can hear the message of remembrance and you can hear the music that can heal our wounds. I think today as we are facing the racial injustice and social unrest, we need to remember those events. We know the terrible danger 
that is facing our democracy. Frankly, I am very happy that I can be part of the education that Terrazin Music Foundation provides because it is this organization that addresses these very critical challenges of our times. I am deeply honored, very pleased to receive this award. A debonair Victor Ullmann poses at the 50th birthday party of his mentor, Arnold Schoenberg. It was 1924, and Ullmann in his mid-20s was a rising composer and conductor active in the thriving cultural life of Prague and Vienna. By the 1930s, he had won critical acclaim for his impressive body of solo, chamber, vocal, and orchestral works. Ullmann spent his last years of freedom in Prague working as a pianist, conductor, and composer, all the while desperately seeking immigration visas for his wife and their three children, Felicia, Maximilian, and Johannes. The Nazis occupied Czechoslovakia in March 1939, and in August, Victor and his wife Anna placed Felicia and Johannes on the last kinder transport to England, where they were separated upon arrival. Quarantined for a case of the measles, Maximilian remained in Prague with his parents and a baby brother, Paul. Anna and Victor soon divorced, and Victor, now with a new wife, was transported to Terezin. Anna was already there with their children. In Terezin, turning to the creativity that sustained him throughout these trials, Ullmann quickly emerged as a major force in the cultural community, playing piano, lecturing, and composing. He also directed the Studio for New Music, a concert series presenting contemporary repertoire, including works by his fellow prisoners. In October 1944, with Pavel Haas and nearly the entire artistic community of Terezin, Ullmann and his remaining family members were sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. About making music in Terezin, Ullmann wrote, our desire for culture was equal to our will to live. The spirit of Ullmann's declaration courses through his music, and you can hear it in his Terezin choral arrangement of Eliyahu Hanavi, a plea, especially urgent in Terezin, for the prophet Elijah to return with the Messiah. <laughs> thank all our artists, speakers, and all the people behind the scenes who made this program possible. We all hope that you will consider supporting the meaningful work of the Terezin Music Foundation. 
And I would encourage you to please contact us if you'd like to have a TMF program in your community. Now I'm seated with these iconic green leather seats from Symphony Hall, seats filled with history and the great acoustic that we all love in Symphony Hall. And I can't help but think of when we will be together again in 2021. Until then, as Anne Frank wrote in her diary, be kind, have courage. We wish you good health and we close with music of compassion and courage. <laughs>